Welcome to the H Files, we, where we will take a deep dive into the lies, the falsifications, and fabrications that we have been told is our historical record. We will investigate conspiracies, speculations, and most importantly, evidence that will make you think twice about much of our recorded history. I am here, as always, with my Liberty Monks cohort and co host, Brother Mike Mundy. How's it going, Brother Mike? I am doing fabulous, my brother. I'm so excited to have the grandmaster of all things flat earth i can't tell you how many hours i spent on youtube watching countless <laughs> documentaries and now it's we can talk to the guru himself well it's an interesting subject uh you and i had the opportunity to talk to mark Sargent, and man if there's anybody that knows about that topic it's him and what's cool is that you know like everything else that we do people get to look at this information and discern hey do you think this is true do you think it's not I tell you, it's, there's some compelling things in, in what he says, and we pre-recorded this a little bit ago, and we thought, what a better, what a better place uh, than H-Files than to have this conversation air so that people can hear it. And it's, it's, I tell you, it's, it's very, very interesting, and he has some, some compelling points, I will say that. So um, with that said, we're going to jump right in. We're going to play the conversation that we did with Mark Sargent, and uh, everybody let us know what you think, but... Um, Without further ado, let's get this thing rolling. Enjoy. I want to inter uh, introduce our next guest uh, for our show this evening. And um, our guest is Mark Sargent. And Mark is from Washington State, I believe. Right, Mark? That is true. Uh, up in the northwest corner of the United States on a little island on the northwest of the northwest corner. In fact, I can see Canada right up the road from here. Nice. There you go. Perfect. Um, and Mark, you, uh, you started playing um, computer games, uh, video games professionally, right? In Boulder, Colorado for part of yeah. your working yep, career? Yep. I was one of the first people in the world to actually be hired to play video games for a living. No kidding. Uh, yeah, not kidding. Back way before there were teams and South of Korea turned it into an industry. I was hired by a little company out in Boulder, Colorado, a little publisher and um, went to conferences and made games better than they were. Meaning, you know, I, I made them look. I was a ringer. I, was, I'm, I wasn't kidding. Really? That's, I went to these conferences and played the games. People were like, wow, it looks so easy. It's like, not so easy. But, uh, but did that's you, what did I you, did. Did you ever think that the video games would get to the point they are today where you can actually, I mean, you obviously you did it professionally, but did you ever think it would millions. get to this point? They do. It's incredible. Um, did I? No, I did. I did think that eventually because I could see where I knew I, I talked to enough developers while I was playing for a living that I knew what everyone was aspiring to do. And the only limit was the tech. You know, we, the, the processor power wasn't there. The graphics power wasn't there. The, the, the memory wasn't there. And I knew eventually, you know, I had some really geeky, nerdy friends. <laughs> they're, 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 they were plotting the graphs. It's like, yeah, we should be able to start hitting it by this point. And they were right. And you just start jumping up. And then we finally capped out at processor speed and, and memory and stuff like that. But yeah, it's, it's incredible. What, uh, it, funny because the things were, we were aspiring to do, the ultimate goal is to create a virtual reality where you can just jump in, you know, like, like the mm -hmm. Matrix or the 13th floor. And right. we're, I don't think, the, it's funny because everybody says, that that's going to be the greatest thing ever. It's like, no, that'll be the ultimate collapse of civilization. Um, let me throw one thing out to you. The, the creator of Dilbert, you know, Dilbert and Dogbert and all that, yeah. he had this wonderful intro to a book where, and he this was way before um, good computer stuff, where he was talking about Star Trek Next Gen, the holodeck. And he said, he goes, the last invention we'll ever create is the holodeck. Because <laughs> once that's created, no one will want to do anything. They will want to make just barely enough money to jack into the holodeck and then that's it and the, he goes, the rest of civilization will just collapse in squalor and he wasn't wrong you know he, he that that has been touched on in movies for a number of years because it's a, the ultimate form of escapism anyway so there you go um so then you spent like 20 years after that um training people in some type of proprietary software right <laughs> Yeah, I jumped from, I stayed in Boulder, Colorado, uh, and taught people time, time and attendance software, which is not time travel software. It is mm -hmm. time tracking software. So I, if you ever have ever punched in or out anywhere for anything, there are, there are companies that build the apps for that. 
And that's what I did. So, and we mostly did it for blue collar factories because people learn in blue collar factories how to work the time clock system. You know, they yeah. figure out how to cheat. And the, the owners don't trust the, the the employees, and the employees hate the owners. So the owners will spend gobs of money on these time clock systems that they can manipulate mm -hmm. and and make sure the rounding rules and all everything are, are the right. So I would go out to all these um, factories and places you'd never, I traveled all across the country um, in places you'd never go to, go to on, on vacation and installed and trained these people, blue collar factory people on, on these time clock software. And that's what I did for a number of years. And it was a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah. Well, I know, I know 2014 was a significant year for you just based on our research and looking into some of the work that you do and kind of where you spend your time now. And again, you know that better than we do. We just know what we read. Um, but you started, you know, there's all these, so there's all these conspiracies out there, right? There's all these things. Well, and some of these conspiracies, like obviously in today's day and age, we're seeing what's happening with COVID and yeah. all the things around that and some of these are more like spoiler alerts than conspiracies i would say that's mike's that's mike's line uh, yeah it's a great that's a great line by the way mike you know? um you that. but you uh you started looking into one that was probably i mean you may even thought this at the time uh, from your perspective but probably the most you know i don't know ridiculous I mean, unbelievable ridiculous conspiracy yeah. ever which is yeah. hey we don't we don't live on a globe we live in a flat plane <laughs> yeah. so flat earth theory right i mean that's that's one of the and i know that started really picking up a lot of traction um you know in 2000 what uh, 15, 15 16 17 because yeah, you heard yeah, yeah. you heard people on rogan and stuff i think eddie bravo was on rogan a bunch of times you started seeing yep. people on you know basketball players like Kyrie irving come and talk about it i yep. think from, i think most people probably dismissed it but you didn't right you you really started looking into this stuff um, I guess, you know, why did you start looking into that? I mean, what was the draw for you? I, conspiracy boredom. That was, that was literally <laughs> it. Uh, I had no, I had, I was, I, I never got married, never had kids. And so I, I had a lot of, if you don't get married and have kids, you have a lot of free time on your hands. And I mean, huge amounts of free time. And I, and plus I was getting into the internet when the internet was, was very young. When, when you had weeks where you could finish the internet, basically, you can just go through it. It's like, yeah, sure. pretty much seen it, you know, like, like a blockbuster rental outfit. And I, I had started, it's like, okay, what haven't I looked into? And you know, everyone knows, everybody in the conspiracy knows about flat earth. It's like, yeah, yeah. That piece of crap, ugly duckling, uh, retarded cousin over there that you don't want to stare at. You don't want to do it. You just don't want to do it. And finally, I'm going, well, I'm not getting any younger. Let's just spend a weekend and, and knock this thing out and, and crush it. Because there's a lot of, I mean, I know about all conspiracies, but there's some I like and there's some I don't, right? Uh, you know, do I believe in, in um, you know, things flying around the sky that aren't the U.S. Air Force? Yeah, you bet. Do I think that Bigfoot had Elvis's baby? Probably not. Probably not going to say yes on that one. But when it came to this, I'm looking, I'm going, I don't want to do it. I don't, it was kind of like Ferris Bueller, um, you know, the guy in the car. It's like, he's going to keep calling me. He's going to keep calling me. I'll go, I'll go. And that's what I did. I finally spent a weekend and tried to shoot it down. And that weekend turned into two weeks and three weeks and five weeks. And I'm, it's like, why can't I prove the globe 100%? Why can't I prove the globe in a court of law anymore? And then nine months later, I mean, nine months later in the uh, beginning of uh, 2015, I just had this Jerry Maguire moment where I woke up and I said, yep, I'm going to go the other way on this. And I started making a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues and I threw them out on the internet. It was just this giant cry for help, which was because I know the internet hive mind is very, very intelligent. Mm -hmm. You know, they miss nothing. You're going to get somebody at 3 a.m. in their underwear in the middle of Nebraska going, <laughs> oh, I've solved it. Whatever it is, you're going to get that that feedback, and sure. that's what happened. Where all of a sudden I threw it out there, and I thought someone was just going to blow it out of the water. Academics going to get some PhD calling me because I put, you know, I did the smartest thing ever. I put all my contact information on the internet. Great idea, absolutely outstanding. I recommend it to everyone. Do that. And so I had people calling me up, but they weren't PhDs. They were engineers and pilots and people from all branches of the military. And they're going, yeah, it's not that nuts. Here's why. Seriously. Get, yeah, yeah. And I get these weird whispered conversations. And some of them wanted to be on, you know, wanted to talk to me on, on the record. And some of them didn't. And they started giving me all this info, stuff I had never thought of. And then finally, after about six months, the, I, you know, any doubts I had in my head, gone. So then uh, people, you know, and again, started getting other people to inspire other people to do other things. And the next thing you know, we started getting, you know, pseudo celebrities and then real celebrities. And then mm -hmm. every, just about every major YouTube channel you could think of did a Flat Earth video. 
just couldn't couldn't help themselves because they they saw everyone tracks the metrics and we were mm-hmm. tracking so vertical that there were people that were going that basically it wasn't just the hits and the and the likes it was the comment sections the comment sections became so polarized because flat earth is extremely polarized um you either oh, sure. love it or you hate it and everybody goes going into it hates it like me and then they get converted and so we have this weird like 99 percent retention rate it's kind of like the matrix red pill blue pill which is mm-hmm. once you're in because because i don't convince you I don't even persuade you. I just throw the idea out there. You're the one that tears it down yourself. You're the one that chips away at the globe until finally it's gone. And so even if you wanted to go back, kind of like the Matrix, how would you? How are you going to put it back together again? And then the um, the Netflix documentary came out uh, in um, 2018. And that was, then everything just went, that was even worse because my my contact information was still out there. So my email load, which is already pretty good, just doubled you know, over like overnight. I woke up one morning. It's like, what happened? And then somebody said, oh, hey, did you know that Netflix <laughs> put out the documentary? It's like, really? Wow, that's great. So, and, and it worked out because the documentary team hated us. Just hated us. Um, they were, like, LA team did it as a side project. It was mm-hmm. it's called Behind the Curve. And, um, but they never were converted the entire time. They, they shot with us for seven months or so. And so, anyway, I'm all. Have over. you, Mike? Have you seen that? Yeah, okay, I have never, never seen that. I didn't even. I didn't. I, honestly, I didn't know that that. Oh was no! A, the, so yeah, Netflix it, did a documentary about flat Earth. Yeah, and it wasn't interesting. Uh, to to be fair about Netflix, I mean, I know they get a lot. They have a lot of muscle, uh, but mm-hmm. they there's a lot of things they don't do. They just buy. So it was it was initially an independent production house out of Los Angeles. Again, just some film people that um, were working for different production houses. They decided to do this as a side project, and then they when they were done, they decided to. If you, if you know anything about um, films, most of the movies that are made in Hollywood never ever make it to the the theater or streaming or anything. Mm-hmm. They're just out there, and so if if that's the case, you have to send it to film festivals. And the film festivals show it, and if they make it into the top ten, you know you have buyers in the audience, like Amazon or or um, iTunes and stuff like that. And the the producers had no faith in the project whatsoever. Uh, they they said, "Oh, no one's going to buy this. Flatter is terrible. It's awful." And uh, they just wanted it on their resume. And then every film film festival that it was submitted to got in, and then they're well, it's like it's never going to get sold. It's like it take years before you ever bought. And like Amazon bought it mm-hmm. immediately, and and then um, iTunes bought it, Apple TV, and and then finally Netflix. They were the holdout. They finally picked it up, and they just you know ripped through Netflix. In fact, it's it's just now leaving Netflix. Funny that I think as of I think it was yesterday, <laughs> after three years of uh, you know doing great on Netflix, and so yeah, and and in fact, even I didn't think it was gonna get. We 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 joked in the community. We we you know we'd say stuff on camera. It's like it's like say whatever you want. <laughs> no one's gonna see this thing anyway. <laughs> That's so. I mean, did, I mean, did this? So this you're saying this? You're saying this got picked up and this was viewed by a ton of people. You're saying? Oh yeah, tons and tons really? of people. I I got to in fact before the whole um, pandemic thing happened. I in 2019, I did, I did uh, conferences in seven different countries. And uh, did, I shot a TV commercial down in Australia, came back, did uh, a morning show in London, came back, and I and they they caught somebody some outfit in London says, hey, yeah, can we McDonald's wants to shoot a um uh, uh a, something they have something over in the UK called Pancake Day, you know, and it's like well the Earth is you know for flat Earth it's going to be a great time it's flat and it's round Pancake Day it'd be awesome and I you know it's like great passports ready just about ready to head over there and all of a sudden the borders started closing because of the oh. whole and oh, no kidding it's like oh no oh no so yeah they, it was wonderful um you know we we couldn't we could do no wrong uh to where you know there was even a, a quick little was it a senate hearing you know where they were trying to when they if you it, it, it kind of glossed over where fake news was one of the the thing one of the one of the things they wanted to talk about and there were three topics they brought up like the head of YouTube and they had said, okay. And YouTube promised, they said, okay, fine. We're going to ban um, snake oil, you know, medical misinformation. Mm-hmm. It, it was initially called snake oil, but then they labeled that. We're going to ban false flags. You can't talk about that on YouTube anymore. And then we're going to recommend flat earth less. <laughs> and it's like, and I'm watching this on a Senate hearing. I'm going, what? <laughs> You're going to do what? 
and sure enough, they um, they reduced our monetization across the board by like oh seventy percent, I think. Which we didn't. I mean, I didn't care as much, but there were a lot of other people in our communities like ah, it sucks. But they didn't. They didn't shut down the channels entirely. Uh, but yeah, it is a wonderful, it was a wonderful ride so far, you know, up until, you know, the pandemic thing, but then we, like, we couldn't do conferences, like all those conferences I was going to, I couldn't go to because one, I couldn't cross international borders because the borders were mm -hmm. closed. And for other reasons that I didn't want to do, you know, things I couldn't do if I was going to cross borders. And then we couldn't do, um, even in the United States, we couldn't find venues like 2020 was supposed to be a big blowout in Vegas. And we couldn't do it because we could not find a single venue in Vegas that would do anything without a mask. So, yeah. Gotcha. Well, you, you wonder why, why flat earth, right? So the powers that be will censor things they don't want to know, like you know, the, the election of 2020, they'll censor that, take videos down. Um, why? Oh, COVID why didn't they destroy us? Co yeah, COVID information, they take that down. Why flat earth? You know, they... They allow Bigfoot to be on the internet. They allow Atlantis. So why, you, you we wonder why, why did they pick on Flat Earth? It's just interesting. Well, initially, why, why did they or why didn't they pick on us more? Right. Uh, right. So, I mean, that's, that's both, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So initially, I thought they let us run, they, 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 they promoted us nonstop for three years, the first mm -hmm. three years, 2015 to 2018. It was shameless. I mean, there's a video I've got on my channel, this mirror from this guy, just this random guy with, you know, average, subs, average subs. And he was talking about, he was making a video about asking people on YouTube how to get things not recommended for him. He's going, he goes, no matter what I do, no matter what topic I put in, recommended for you keeps showing up at least three or four flat earth videos. He goes, it doesn't matter what topic I put in. They just keep <laughs> recommending these flat earth videos to me. And they were talking to this European guy, because it all comes down to like one or two programmers. And it was like this one programmer who wrote the algorithm for what is recommended for you, right? You, when you get things, you wonder why. It's this one guy <laughs> that, that, was, that was it. And he says... It was interesting. Out of all the topics he could have brought up, you know, thousands and thousands of topics he could have brought up about YouTube, he brings up one. And he goes, he goes, well, he goes, if the average person that gets into Flat Earth watches 20 videos in a row, he goes, what do you think we're going to recommend? And what he was basically saying was, because people forget, it's like YouTube, you know, there's, there's Netflix and there's, you know, Hulu and Vudu and all these others. He goes, but technically, you know, from a numbers standpoint, YouTube's the biggest television network in the world. Right. It's all amateur hour, but mm -hmm. it's still the biggest network in the world. And they were looking for binge topics. And when they looked at the trends, they're going, when people go down the rabbit hole of flat earth and they just keep going because you know, again, it's so blows people. It's like, what? I'm just going to keep clicking. No, I'm not going to go to work. I'm just going to keep clicking. And once they, once that happened there, they were really looking for something to promote binge, you know, binge worthy. And so they, they just keep doing it and they kept working. Meaning, you know, it's recommended. It's, oh, hey, that guy's never looked at a flat earth video in, in his life. He's been watching for two days straight. And they just keep doing that. And then after three years, they decided, I think we had saturated just about everything you could think of. So they, they, they pulled back and, and people said, oh, well, they're censoring us. And I said, no, they're, they're not hitting the brakes. They're just letting their foot off the gas. There's a big difference there. They mm -hmm. never once tore down our channels. And if you're wondering why they didn't crack down on us too much two reasons one because flat earth is what's it hurting meaning out of all the conspiracies out there it's flat earth is not dark and sinister and people don't talk like batman when they're describing it you know it's very very it's it's upbeat meaning you know it's flat, flat earth it's about the world itself and you're in a dome and there could be god and and all these fun things and 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 we proved that because there were so many more women that got into into this than than hmm. men. I mean, the conspiracy world, as you know, I mean, it's, it's dominated mostly by men. But with flat Earth, I was going to the conferences. There was a lot of women. They weren't there for me. They were just there for the topic. And it was it was amazing. And I, I asked them, I was like, "Why are you here?" And it's like, "Well, it's so hopeful and it's full of it's optimistic. I like that." It's like, "Okay, great, wonderful." Um, so that was good. So I mean, seriously, shutting down. If you let's put it this way, if YouTube shut down Flat Earth, <laughs> you might as well just just be a broad spectrum, you know, conspiracide and just wipe the, everything else out because everything goes after that. There's there's no safe haven for the conspiracy world. Um, the other thing I believe is I think they let us do it because. 
flat earth seems to open the minds up to a lot of other potential things both good and bad meaning if you believe in that thing behind me there mm-hmm. you know, the whole the whole flat earth thing then you're probably open-minded to a whole lot of other things and i think that i firmly believe this is that we were just the the, the picture frame for a canvas that's only now being unfurled meaning flat earth kind of keeps that you know the there's a you know the whole shock and awe thing what's happening now it doesn't seem to shock people as much and it could you know we could have helped in that in that regard so maybe we were inadvertently being used by you know the puppet masters to you know the topic was being used by the puppet masters to sort of soften people up to other things i mean seriously you could you could roll out a project blue beam right now I don't think it'd freak out that many people by comparison. I mean, yeah, the, the NPCs and the normies, sure, maybe, but the rest right, of the right. people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that makes sense. <laughs> well, mean, just, go ahead. Well, as I was just saying, it's, it's interesting because, you know, obviously, you know, we're, we're it's, it's a very, it's a very outlandish statement to say that it's flat and that it's not a spinning globe because look, we're, we're taught all this science, right? We're taught. Yeah. But the solar system, and we're taught all these things that um, we, you know, again, well, we're, you know we're, more we're, about. I, I'm not a scientist, so I don't, I don't, I don't really follow all that stuff. But I just know what I learned in school, and that's just, you know, that's what you, that's the mainstream thing. So, I guess what what brought you to this conclusion? Because I would, have been, I would venture to say that the vast majority of people believe in what they were taught through school and everything. Like, you know, I mean, okay, uh, just the reality of the of the world we live in is what we're what we're taught. And so, I guess what brought you to that conclusion? Okay, what brought it to me? First off, um, and I, I will try to condense it, which is what you just said there, which what we are taught. It was in it, there was an interesting passage, and I've got it up on my, my thing here, and you guys can look it up. So George Orwell, you know, the George Orwell, mm-hmm. he wrote back in 1946 because he was curious about why people believe things just because the media and the government tell them. Mm -hmm. there's things and he was talking and he's he was not a flat earther but he but he mentioned there's this little quote where he goes most people have asked to prove that the earth is round would not even bother to produce um the rather weak arguments i have outlined above they would just start off by saying that everyone knows the earth to be round and if pressed further would become angry he goes in a way shaw is right it is a credulous age and the burden of knowledge which we now have to carry is partially responsible and what he meant by that was Remember, he wrote this in 1946, and you could walk down the street and ask anyone how they know the Earth is a globe, right? And they would just say, we know, it is known, Game of Thrones, it is known, right? It's like, yeah, but it's 1946, NASA isn't even founded until 1958, so how do you know? And then all of a sudden, the wheels start grinding, which (laughs) is why he was getting angry. It's not that you know that the Earth is round, you were told. And your father was told, and his father, going back 500 years at least, so you'll be to a point where most people couldn't even read and write. That that's the that's where it starts. It's like the conditioning is so there. I mean, come on, it's the only it's the only conspiracy we debunk to children. By the way, we don't talk to children about JFK or 9/11 <laughs> or any of that other stuff, but we do. I mean, f- kindergarten, first grade, right off the bat, it's like, yeah. By the way. You used to think the Earth was flat. Now it's this funny little blue spinny toy, right? That, that you know they hold up and then they put it in the corner of the classroom and it sits there for twelve years. Um, incredible conditioning, having that thing sit in the classroom for twelve years. You know, you know, it's not like they're seeing a lot of space photos. It's not like they have their own rocket ship, but it sits there in the corner for twelve years, right below the American flag, by the way. And you know, the American. And I mean, that's that's CIA pays good money for that sort of conditioning, but but we put it through our education for free. But to your point, so, so I've got five quick bullet points. Mm-hmm. Why and why did I believe in it? Well, because, I mean, we, now we have, right, don't we have photos and everything like that? And don't we have a space program? And those, I mean, are, so again, I, again, just putting the, the, it out for, there. There's, there's certain things you got to look up. Do I believe that NASA is absolutely lying through their teeth? And they have been since they were created in 1958. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, for for what? And in fact, there's some giveaways. Like, like everybody, like everybody at NASA, like they're all no, in no, on no, it. No, 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 not at all. In fact, 99 percent of the people that work at NASA don't know anything. Because straight up compartmentalization, which is, I mean, the people <laughs> that do HR, the people that polish the fuel systems, 
um, the people that sweep the floors, they don't know anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a wonderful movie that was tied to this years ago, an independent film called Capricorn One, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's probably one of uh, one of O.J. Simpson's only serious roles. He's one of the astronauts. And what they do in it is they fake a Mars mission. And why do I bring this up? Why do I tie this to NASA? Because in the movie, you realize nobody at NASA knows except for the telemetry guys. Meaning when the rocket goes up and you can't see it anymore, the only way you know where to track the rocket is through the telemetry guys. And the guy says, oh, it's mm -hmm. here in 3D space. This is where it is. It's 70 miles this way and 40 miles you know, up, and this is where the rocket is. And you realize that all you have to do is control those guys. And if though, you know, and once, because that's all you're feeding to the public anyway, it's like, where's the rocket? Well, the rocket's here. You, you know, show them some numbers. It's like, okay, well, that guy's smart. He's wearing a lab coat. He must know what he's doing. So, but the other thing with NASA was the lack of pictures, which is, well, it's like, we have plenty of pictures now. I will tell you a quick story. When mm -hmm. I was running um, a tech support team for a time and attendance company back in, in Colorado years ago, uh, in 2000, you know, the internet was, it wasn't completely up and, and running full bore, but it was, it was still getting there. Um, I remember I thought I'll, I'll make all these iconic shots and I'll put backgrounds of the globe on every single monitor. I'll make sure they're different ones. And I, and I kept putting all these different strings like earth from space, you know, space globes, you know, all these different Boolean strings. And I kept getting one image and one image only the screen was just filling up with the same freaking image which was the apollo 17 blue marble shot you can look it up today oh sure yeah i've seen that the apollo 17 mm -hmm. blue marble shot first blue marble shot ever taken you know when the second blue marble shot was taken no i don't 43 years later <laughs> in the summer of 2015 when we started ramping up i only knew this because Obama tweeted about it. It's like the first, you know, that's the second blue marble shot. It's a terrible impression, but go with me on this. <laughs> gotcha. the, it was the, the press release was written by Scott Kelly, who supposedly wrote it from the space station. He didn't supposedly take the shot. It was taken by somebody else. And it just blew my mind. It's like, wait, 43? You, you know how long that is in the technology world? We're talking most of this. Is, the first one was taken in 1972, the blue marble shot. It was like, okay, so what happened between Apollo 9 and Apollo 16? No one took any full disc shots at all. And then the last time you're coming back, it's like, oh, I better take one because we're not going to be up here again for a long time. You take one. And then most of the 70s, all of the 80s, all of the 90s, 2000 to 2010, and then halfway to 2020, then you take him the second shot. Nobody so, else took a shot of the of so the you're, earth. And, you're, you're saying there's no there's no other pictures at all until then. That's not like, any full disc. Really? You know, no, they're not. They're all hmm. partials or really close ups. And it just blew my mind. I mean, you can look. It's in fact, I've got the link. I'll even send it to you. The uh, the blue marble shot. It was just blew. It blew my mind because it was on the White House when Obama was doing his thing. It's like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. you know, the blue okay. marble shot. So. So when, when you're looking for NASA, it's not just what's there, it's what's not there. And there are so many things that aren't there. I mean, I could spend, I could spend an entire show just on the Apollo program, for example, which is, you know, um, the, Apollo, the Apollo missions, there were so many things that went wrong. The pictures that were taken were iconic, but the more you stare at them, the more they don't make any sense. And the reason they don't make sense is we teach nothing. Come on, American education. I've got teachers in my family. No offense to them, but we teach people almost nothing. When it's like we, it's like, can you drive? Great. Can you write your name? Great. Get out of here. Go, go do life. Go, go do your slave work. You know, we teach people almost nothing about engineering and physics and biology and microbiology and all the other stuff. And so nobody gets it. It's like, we'll just listen to the people in the lab coats. They're smart. So when you watch the Apollo program and you, you realize it's like, oh yeah. So there, apparently there's just four inches of ash on the moon it's perfectly uniform and you never see anyone with a shovel digging a hole because you don't want to dig into the set or um there's no blast crater underneath the the lander or the the the, the car battery powered transponder that has maybe a range of 50 miles it's punching through the van allen radiation belts and it's doing 10 frames of color video a second in 1969 in perfect two-way communication what are you lining it up with or the spacesuit, which completely defies thermodynamics Meaning you can look this up on YouTube any day you want. Like anything in a vacuum chamber that's pressurized just detonates. Volleyball, football, can of soda, He-Man, you know, oh, sorry. Uh, no, not He-Man, uh, Stretch Armstrong. 
anything anything that's got any pressure in it which leads into mike's thing it's like the, the tesla roadster in space let's segue to that so fa- fast forward yeah because that was a uh, that was elon musk did that they they launched something some years back wasn't it yeah, or, yeah. A few years ago yeah, a few years ago, he supposedly took he, one of his his one of his old Teslas from. Uh, by the way, Elon Musk did not create Tesla; it was a completely different group. He just bought them, but it's a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. It drives me nuts when people tie him. It's like, no, no, he created Tesla. It's like, no, no, he didn't. He just bought it. So he takes this convertible, this red convertible, and puts it in space. Does not retrofit it at all. Supposedly just launches it up, pops open the capsule, and it's fine. With three HD cameras, with perfect communication, beaming back to Earth, even though this thing just spinning really, really fast. I'm going, wow, communication is really great. And nothing's happening to the car. Meaning it's negative 250 or it's positive 300 degrees. And the, the windows aren't spider webbing. The, the, the side windows should have broke inside the, the thing, should have, should have turned into the glass. The front window should have shattered. All the pressurized systems should have blown up, even though it's not a gas-powered car. There was all sorts of, you know, the hydraulic system and the brake system. The window wash, hell, the window washer fluid alone should have shattered. The tires should have turned into bombs and blown the, the fiberglass everywhere. The car was in absolute pristine condition. And that driver that was sitting in the, in the passenger seat drove me nuts because there was no endorsements on him at all. This country is all about marketing and greed and money and power. That thing should have looked like NASCAR, and it didn't. In fact, there's no logos on it at all. Two, two companies, one private, one public. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, SpaceX and Tesla, no logos anywhere on those cars whatsoever. Why? It's like you, you, you could have done, and it was never done ever, ever since then. It's like car companies, why didn't all the car, car companies try to do some sort of thing in space? You know, it never, ever did. Or, or one more thing. Why did they use the, the convertible version? The flagship is the S model, the, four, the four-door sedan that everyone's driving nowadays. Why didn't they use that? You could sell per seat. I mean, hell, Disney alone. Disney alone, you could have put, because the, the driver was just generic. Are you kidding? Four people, you could put, because they own the rights to everything now, Disney. You could put, I don't know, Stormtrooper in the driver's seat. You got Iron Man riding shotgun. You got Groot in the back seat. And it actually would have been pretty, pretty cool. Next to <laughs> That thing would have paid for itself. <laughs> yet there's nothing happening. So no, it was and, and somebody sent me the <laughs> video link to that. And I only saw this first still shot. And I remember thinking, I wrote back, I was like, who made this? I go, who, who, who photoshopped this? They go, no, dude, that's a live stream. I'm going, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? It's a live stream. It can't be. And then it was like, oh, we're gonna slingshot things this thing off to Mars, a perfect chance to spin that thing around and start looking at the, the earth as it goes back into the distance never happened they just cut communication i'm going why'd you cut communication it's like well the battery was gonna run out it's like what seemed fine in fact why wouldn't you just let the battery run out why would you just turn it off and why so that's how that played out they just cut the communication Yeah, Uh, communication. okay that that, that was it and that to this day you know uh, there's there's certain things that they say well how could somebody from the space program prove to you that the earth is actually a globe i go well the the easiest thing was give me a 4k camera put it on something like that whatever the rocket is something that's going to be leaving orbit point it down at the ground eventually the earth will form into a ball and that's it it's never happened in the history of space travel even by accident so why not i mean why not it's statistically impossible and by the way on a side note uh find me any footage of an astronaut that even did a 180 with the camera running never happened especially on the moon okay well that's (laughs) Well, that's interesting. I mean, it's all interesting stuff, you know. Um, I mean, I mean, we've all seen rocket launches, right? So, um, rocket are, launches. Are you saying those are faked? No, no. Is the that... rockets, are, the rockets are real. Um, could they be helium assisted? Probably. Uh, you know, the the follow up question to that would be the or a side or a side note to that would be the satellite systems, which is like, oh, the satellites can't be fake. I'm going really look up. It's not even a secret. It's not. It's not even classified material. NASA is the biggest producer and consumer of helium in the world. Why? Because they launch huge satellites on balloons. For whatever reason, they don't even talk about it. They just launch it up to four tons, 8,000 pounds. Wonderful videos of some of these things going off in the wind and crashing into things, doing all sorts of destruction. I've got videos on my channel. And they can stay up there. It's not like weather balloons where they go up, you know, to certain altitude, 130, 140,000 feet and just pop. They can get up even higher and stabilize them. And it, the point is, is like, if you can get a four ton payload up there and stabilize it, then why would you ever launch anything on a rocket? 
but you still got to launch the rockets because, well, that's the whole part of the program, isn't it? You got to prove people there's rockets. So if you look any time lapse thing of a rocket, they go up and they go vertical. I'm sorry. They go vertical and they go horizontal almost immediately. And then they just send them off over the ocean, ditch in the ocean somewhere and then recover them or not recover them. It doesn't really matter. But it gives the great illusion to the public that, well, it's a program where you should be spending a lot of money. And they do. Would they, NASA, I think, in adjusted dollars right now, they're getting $54 million a day. That's a pretty good budget. You know, and, and, and which is disappointing because their production values are not very good. You know, if a Hollywood studio got $54 million a day, there's nothing they, could, they couldn't accomplish. Uh, which is why when I see movies, based on, well, they couldn't fake things. I go, really? Watch Gravity again. With Sandra Bullock, watch that closely. Put it up on a big screen. That's a good movie. movie. It's gorgeous. It, yeah. it is, and then compare it to one of Stanley Kubrick's, one of the first movies, mm -hmm. uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey from 1968. Put that on Blu-ray. Gorgeous. It's like we can do that in 1968. Don't tell me we can't fake stuff. We can fake anything we want. In fact, the Americans fake it better than just about anyone. Which, on a side note, would be why the Russians quit. I don't remember people forget I, I know i'm older but it's like people forget we had the space race whereas the americans and the soviets oh, sure, you know, yeah because the first one is the moon and then all of a sudden the americans get to the moon even though the soviets were beating the tar out of us in the early things it's like oh we got the sputnik and we got the dog and we got all this stuff we got we got people doing up and then all of a sudden the americans get up to the moon and the russians just quit when does that happen in the history of sports? <laughs> it's like the first guy crosses the finish line and the people like, oh, they're running. It's like, ah, it's over. Let's just go home. Let's pack it in. No, it would have been the exact opposite, especially with the Soviet Union, right? It would have been, we put two people, they put three, we put five, small base, large base. And then Time Magazine runs a thing that says, um, uh, has the Cold War reached the moon? Which is exactly what would have happened. But it, that's not it. And I know exactly why it didn't go down that way, and which is, it was continuity which is the, how they fake things is not exactly how we fake things. Meaning... Okay, what do you when, mean by if that? We're yeah. using a studio. You have two... St in fact, if you have studios even in the same city in Los Angeles, the, the continuity is, is so tough to do. You put them in different countries. All right. Hey, why is the ash different color in, in the Russian stuff? Why is this... Why do they have stars in some of their shots and we don't? Why, you know, why people in the internet, you know, come on. Mm -hmm. we, there's sure. there's yeah. movies... There's sites out there called moviemistakes.com, which are... You can, if, if a character, if a coffee cup moves from here to here and the character didn't move it and the scene just happened, oh, People they're going to call you out. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, and things I've get seen plenty missed. of those. Yeah. yeah. The, things get missed. People forget that the very first cut that was released to theaters of Lord and the Rings, when they were leaving the Shire, there was a car driving in the background. And everyone missed it in the production house because they were staring at the damn hobbits. No one was paying attention to what was going on in the, in the left field. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, dude, there's a white car making a turn up there. <laughs> it's like, well, on, on that topic, you wonder if, if, you know, you see shots from the moon and there's never any stars in the background, right? right. So you wonder, do they would know that someone with a calculator and a ruler would have figured out by the star mapping that it's not, it's not adding up. So yeah. Take them out. Yeah, yeah. Ner yeah and and, and yeah. I know, look, I am a huge nerd at heart, uh, which is it doesn't take much. I call them the nerd Illuminati meetings, which is you have a group of people and you're going, and we can't, remember, this is 1969, right? And they're, they're like slide rules and really expensive calculators. And they're going, so the belt of Orion should be here on this tight de time date stamp. But, you know, three hours later, it has to be here. And that's, that gets really frustrating in meetings like that. And finally, someone at the end of the table, whoever's calling the shots, going, yeah, let's just get rid of them. Get rid of the stars. We'll just say it's an, some exposure thing. Nobody's going to know. No one's going to care. And that was the running thing, which was, oh, it's an exposure setting. And, and, but then they had to get the astronauts to come back later and say, no, no, we never saw any stars at all. Because then the follow-up question would have been, well, if it's an exposure setting, why didn't you just set it at least one roll of film so you could see the stars? But no, they couldn't because there would be too many questions. I mean, it'd be just like, hey, because some, some nerd is going to say, hey, didn't you see the Big Dipper when you were pointing your camera and setting up the flag over there? And, you know, if you catch him, you know, in a lie, which is why also the astronauts went into complete seclusion afterwards. These guys should have been on a permanent high right? Should have been absolutely jacked up beyond belief, but they weren't. They, they all turned to the bottle. They all, no one did press conferences. Buzz Aldrin barely did anything. I mean, yeah, they go to a couple conferences here and there, 
but they were pretty quiet about it. And the international press conference was just stunning. It, you know, they were just down. And I just, you know, because again, you, you it's tough to take, I don't think, in fairness, I don't think even they knew until the very end, kind of like Capricorn won, they were told until after, you know, they, 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 I think they were supposed to be, it was like the right stuff, the movie where they were going to be heroes and boy scouts. And then they were told, it's like, oh yeah, by the way, you're astronauts now, you're not going to do anything. Here's why. And that really tore them to shreds, which is why I think all the astronauts now, which are, you know, same thing, Air Force officers, they're just told, it's like, okay, you're going to fake this. We're not telling you why it's beyond your pay grade. That's it. And that way, you know, you have deniability. I'm sure you suspect, but it's like anything. Until you know, you don't know. Mm -hmm. So you can you can make assumptions all you want, or, you know, the, uh, you talk to somebody higher up, you know, an astronaut, and somebody says, yeah, you really shouldn't be asking those questions. Because <laughs> yeah, those guys, when you get up to that level in the military, you know, colonels, I mean, there's full bird colonels on, the, uh, on, on some of these things. Um, you don't make it that high without knowing when to, you know, not ask questions. Mm -hmm. Plus, you'd well, also psychological profile these guys and, and tap their emails and phones. and mm -hmm. They're not doing anything without them knowing. So, so, so Mark, um, when it comes to all right, the, the, the planet, then, what you're saying is that we're floating through space and it's just flat instead of uh, a globe? Or are you, are you saying that it's something completely different? Uh, it's it's something completely different. Uh, the the question then I throw back at you and anyone else is mm -hmm. how do you know that there's space to begin with? The the most frustrating thing about the media dealing with the whole flat Earth concept is that they keep showing this asteroid, this flat asteroid flying through space, this rogue asteroid, mm -hmm. and with all the other planets are spherical, and it's like this doesn't make any sense. It's like it's a dumb concept. It's like why would there be spherical planets? And then a rogue flat asteroid in a solar system. I mean, well, I'm sure you dumb. can appreciate that. I mean, it sounds kind of silly, right? It, it is silly, but, you know, look, even flat earthers have limits when it comes to silliness. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is one of them. So what I throw back and say, look, there doesn't have to be space. If we are living in a planetarium, then everything, then everything you see up in the sky is just lights on a ceiling. No different than, uh, than an actual planetarium that we've had around since, I don't know, the, oh, wow, going back all oh, yeah. the way uh, to the- I've been 50s. in planetariums, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know it kind of dates They're me cool. and young, younger people don't go in, but if you showed a planetarium to somebody that didn't know anything about technology, it'd freak them out. If you blindfolded somebody that hadn't <laughs> known any tech and you bring them in, it's like, what is happening? Why is the moon there? Or we, you know, the, the night sky, you can, pre you can fake a lot of such, which is why the, the Truman show was so fascinating because that was really like a 20 mile wide dome that was meant to, to fool one person. In reality, mm -hmm. you could have fooled a whole bunch more people than that, than just one person and never would have worked out. Nowadays, we know that, that, that whole concept would have died, but, but the technology was very, very real and you could have, you could have fooled somebody. So no, what I'm talking about is we're living in a building that could be on a desk or in a lab or something like that. Uh, a, a construct, a Hollywood soundstage that is so big and so well designed that even our best and brightest didn't figure it out till about 1960. And when they did figure it out, they decided not to tell anybody because it's a re because there's too many things. Like, okay, why would you keep the secret? Why would you keep the secret? We didn't build this. We have nothing to do with the engineering of this place. It's way mm -hmm. beyond our engineering capabilities. But we can keep the secret. Why? Because by if you don't find out till 1960, the cement's already dried on our civilization. Things have already been built. And what I have learned over in my lifetime is that people in power don't take chances. They just don't. And I know it's like, well, that's a part of like organized crime too. What is that line from uh, Heat? If there is ever a doubt, there is no doubt, right? Which is, you ever doubt somebody? Yeah, you got to take care of that <laughs> because that's not going to fly. So, and because if you didn't keep the secret, three bad things could happen. One is academics. So you're talking about every university in every country in the world. Um, it doesn't matter what it is astrophysics and astronomy, those would be torn down probably forever. And then the remaining physical sciences, I don't know, biology, hydrology, archaeology, geology, those have to, anything with anology has to be rebuilt completely. Libraries have to be emptied out. And then you've got things like, I don't know, the, the world markets economically, you'd have to suspend world markets for months because you didn't know what the hell it meant. I mean, come on, they're really twitchy as it is. And mm -hmm. this would just disrupt it to no end. But the big one would be the religious side of things. You're talking about the five major religious houses of this world. Um, 
Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, you're giving them leverage, all of them leverage against science simultaneously. And you're saying, show restraint. <laughs> I know science has been beating you over the head with textbooks for the last five centuries. It'll be fine. Just don't take it out. Don't take it personally. Oh Lord, it would, it would, it would be a bloodbath. I mean, the, the, all these groups would come back at science like, okay, so you were wrong about something really, really big. You know what? Let's revisit some of your other stuff, shall we? I don't know. Evolution, carbon dating, the Big Bang, uh, you know, dark matter. And they just go on and on. And, you know, well, sure. the it, it kind of opens Pandora's box a little. I mean, it really which does. You will never be able to close. Science would never, could never Interesting. recover from huh. that. So at that point, you so that's the shortest Illuminati nerd meeting ever, right? <laughs> you get these guys sitting around a long, dark table and say, what's the worst that could happen? And then that guy gives the speech. And then the guy at the end going, yeah, so we're not talking to anybody about this until we can figure out how we roll it out to where we can use it to our advantage, which is why here we are you know, 2022 it's way more acceptable to talk about that sort of thing than it was in 1960. Right. And, and look, I'm one of those conspiracy people that I believe in the greater good. I do. I always have. Mm -hmm. So if in 1960, yeah, that's a good move. No, you don't tell people you get a member just 13 years earlier. You had to deal with Roswell and Roswell freaked the hell out of people. Roswell it sure did. Yeah. People were just losing their minds. And that was just some newspaper and radio. It wasn't even television. So, it, so 13 years later, that was a, it was a pretty quick decision. And they're like, yeah, no, nah, not yet. Not yet. Maybe one day, but not yet. So there you go. Well, so, if it was ever proven that we are living in a engineered design, right. Then that yeah. would then prove that there's a God or, well, a, yeah. or, or a creator. Yeah. And, 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 at that me, and at that point, then that's a good point. All that matters that. to people then is hmm. getting to heaven. And they don't care about economics or government or rules yep. or monetary system. All that would matter was, would be that. So there was a wonderful movie <laughs> um, that hardly anybody saw with Robert Redford uh, called The Discovery. And it was fairly recent. And it was, it was about the movie opened. This is to your point, Mike, which is the movie opened with a scientist had figured out through his research team studying brain waves of people recently deceased mathematically that an afterlife existed. And the second he released that paper, something like 40 million people in, in the world just committed suicide immediately, right? Which wasn't a huge number, but it was a big jump, right? A big uptick. And then during the movie, through, throughout the, the meandering of the movie, they figured out, they, they can figure out visually a way. And I know it kind of rips off from Brainstorm with Christopher Walken back in the day, but, um, but they showed visually what was happening. They actually had a clip you know, they could, they were watching somebody die and they were showing, they were showing on the monitor what they were seeing. And they were showing that they're like, oh, they're going back and they're fixing in some of their mistakes. And the second, uh, the scientist, Robert Redford, the lead scientist realized the implications of this. He said, all right, destroy that tape, destroy the machine, destroy everything. This never happened because he realized the implications of it, which is if you show and it's something I had talked about for decades ago which was if you even had a 30 second clip of the afterlife, a mm -hmm. good afterlife, people would bail all the time, you know, because people aren't, you know, they, pe this world is 99.9% .9 suffering in some way, you know, there's conflict. It doesn't matter how beautiful, how powerful, how rich, how talented you are. There is always something to complain about always. Oh, sure. And there's some people that suffer more than others. And if they realize like, Oh, there's a better place. Yeah, so there's a bridge over there. I'm going to go for a walk. And that, that's <laughs> multiply that by a whole bunch of people. So yeah, it's, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is one of those things where, now it doesn't prove anything about an afterlife, but it right. absolutely proves this, like this, the default shape of it. It's like, look, if this was built, then it was built by something or someone. And then you've got two choices, either an advanced civilization that's older and more powerful than ourselves, mm -hmm. or the divine. I'm not talking about the, the whole Santa Claus in a bathrobe, you know, on a Sunday morning <laughs> type divine. I'm talking about some, some, but then you're just splitting hairs because one man's advanced civilization is another man's deity. I and mean, either way, you know, one step closer to knowing God's phone number than us. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so uh, you had mentioned, so you've covered a bunch of stuff here. What you have mentioned yeah. some other things that you, you, have looked at that you consider to be the evidence, right? That kind of right. steered you towards this. What some what, what are some of the other, I guess, uh, evidence in your mind that um, 
I'll give you the the five big my five big bullet points. Okay. So there are, and I can I can email this to you afterwards as well. Um, yeah, so sure, there was a fine. German a German television team uh, network called ZF1, the equivalent of like ABC over here, and they said, okay, we're going to get you in touch with a astrophysicist, and we want you to talk to him, but we're not going to have you talk to him directly because people, when they get PhDs, apparently lose the power of speech. I don't know what it is. They're so tunnel vision, which is why you don't see PhDs on the media. The, the media only uses Bill Nye, um, which is, I, I shouldn't open with him, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Cox from England, Michio Kaku from Japan, and Bill Nye. Those are the only four guys you see ever see, scientists you ever see on television because they can talk on TV. The rest of the guys mm -hmm. don't know anything. So anyway, they got this guy from Georgetown. And they said, okay, you're not going to talk to him directly. What we're going to do is we're going to like, uh, we're going to pass notes through school. We're going to have, we're going to have you record some stuff and we're going to give him the video and we're going to have him respond in a video. We're going to about, you guys are never going to talk. It's like, all right. And I got, I got that. I understood. I've talked to enough scientists that I realized they're just, they're too tunnel vision. They, they just can't talk. So I, they said, come up with five sciencey things. It's like, okay. Fine. So, and I won't read them exactly, but I'll, I'll give you kind of the, 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 the gist of it, right? So number one, the, the one, the number one point that sucks people into flat earth more than anything. Mm -hmm. I had nothing to do with it at all. Was not in the clues at all. People give me credit for it. They shouldn't, which is long distance photography. Number one, without a question, which is if you're looking off in the distance, mainstream science says that the curvature formula is eight inches per mile per mile. And I know people listening, it's like, I didn't study algebra in junior high. I don't know what that means. <laughs> It's eight inches per mile squared, which means at 10 miles, it's 10 times 10, which is 100 times eight inches is 800 inches, which means at 10 miles, there should be 800 inches of curvature. And it gets worse and worse from there. It's not, it's not inches, eight inches per mile because that'd be like stairs. That would be a slope. Sure. Yeah. It's gonna, eventually, it's going to go vertical. So at 50 miles, it's 50 times 50 times eight inches, which is six, uh, you know, 1,670 feet, roughly. I normally say it's 1,666, but then people would be like, oh, we don't want to talk about 666. <laughs> so at 17, 16, 1,700 feet, let's round up. That means that, that whatever object is out there at 50 miles has to be taller than 1,700 feet. Otherwise, it's going to be on the other side of the hill, right? The other side of the curve. And 20 years ago, I would have been right there with you. Then like, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. However, that's not the case anymore. Now, because of HD technology... Now you can zoom in on things that are gone and bring them back into frame. Boats that are absolutely gone. You watch them go and it's like, well, they went over the right. Yeah, we've all seen that. Yep. Sure. Nope. Lake Michigan and yep. the ocean yep. and all that stuff. Sure. Yep. Not anymore. Now, depending on atmospheric conditions, which do change, because remember what we're talking through right now is not nothing. It is 80% nitrogen is a little bit of 20% oxygen. There's some trace gases. Forget about oh, sure. that. Yeah. But you're, we're basically talking through a soup. You know, we're not even walking through life. We're basically swimming. You know, it's, it's so weird, which is why how planes work. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Really so what that, that's the big thing. Long distance photography, mm. which is you can see farther now than you should be able to. That's number one with a bullet. Um, number two would be um, vacuum versus gravity, which is, and I'll do a quick thing for you. Let's say there's a second story where you're sitting right above you, right? And you converted it into a little vacuum chamber right? It's not like the movies and you have a little valve, right? You pop it. What happens, right? It's not like the movies again, where you mm -hmm. hear this hissing sound. It's, it's like, Oh, there's only two minutes of air left. Get the duct tape. No, it's instant. It's violent. It's horrifying. Ask anyone in the submarine biz. Let's ask anyone the, the deep sea oil rigs. Oh, it's, for sure. yeah. it's awful. It is it's the most powerful and incredible. Cause you were talking about molecules in one area, and nothing in the other. It has to equalize, and it equalizes absolutely instant in a fraction of a second. Um, so what? So and the point is, it's like okay. So you pop the valve where you are right now, and your all your air rushes upstairs, right? What happens? Well, if you aren't sucked up through the hole, you're probably going to black out. You may may even die, right? So when you go outside, what's keeping the atmosphere outside from rushing off into the vacuum of space? And your initial hmm. knee-jerk reaction will always be every single time because it's what we are taught. It's like gravity. Gravity, That's yeah. it. Well, it's got to be. It's got to be gravity. You go, you mean the same gravity that couldn't keep the air in your room from going upstairs? That gravity? Because it couldn't do it. And it's a million times out of a million times. It can't do it. So why, when I go outside, why is the gravity holding everything down? 
And I've even had people, I mean, their minds just spin. They don't know what to do with they, They're like, well, there's more gravity. No, no, no. Same gravity. In fact, there's even more vacuum force. The thing that was above you wasn't even a, a huge vacuum. We're talking about the massive infinite vacuum of space. What is holding the atmosphere on this world? In fact, not only that, and I've asked scientists this, and they do not have an answer. I go, tell me where the exact bleeding edge of space is. Tell me where... The, our, our air ends and the vacuum of space begins. Tell me what happens there. What, what happens? There's a little trailing off. It doesn't grab anything and the vacuum just doesn't care. It's just kind of tickling the atmosphere. It doesn't do anything. No, that's not it. That's absolutely not what happens. Scientists doesn't want to touch it. Uh, number three, which would be the, um, the eclipse shadow, which is the moon, supposedly, even though that doesn't even make sense. Our moon, by the way, is absolutely, from an astronomy standpoint, it makes no sense at all. It's way too big for our planet. Look at every other moon in our solar system. They're tiny by comparison. Our moon is huge. It's, it's 2,000 large, mi yeah. 2, miles wide, if you believe them, right? And the Earth is only supposedly 8,000 miles wide. So this thing up there, why does a 2,000-mile-wide object, when we're in eclipse season, you know, wherever you are, why is the blackout zone, the shadow that's cast, right, mm -hmm. on the ground, why is it only 70 miles wide? kind of odd isn't it because you know airplanes I mean what, what i mean there is when an airplane flies across if you're lucky enough you're up you know you're on the ground and a small plane flies you know in front of the sun you see that full-blown shadow on on the ground in front of you you can't miss it shadows cannot be made smaller this they're always actual size or larger but in the moon's case the moon shadow is is 99 smaller why? What, how does that happen? When you, have you ever walked by a building and seen your shadow shrink down to the size of an action figure? Nope. No one has. No. But the moon, the moon supposedly does it in science. Like, well, it, like a like a reverse magnifying glass, but with a shadow. And it, that's 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 how when they come up with all sorts of fun stuff. It's like, no, no. If that was the case, then when the Earth passed in front of the sun and the moon was on the other side, the the shadow on the moon should be I don't know 250 miles wide. The the moon should turn into a giant eyeball never does you get this big crescent shadow but it's way too big shouldn't be that big the earth's only eight thousand miles wide no one wants to talk about it number four uh <laughs> which is the moon temperature this one blew me away i was in the flat earth at least a year and a half before somebody called into a podcast and said dude you know the moon is actually cold and i'm going okay and we we're laughing it's like it's what, do, a, what do you mean cold like exactly just... that's what it's like what do you mean it's cold at night everyone knows that it's a dumb hang up caller and no, no, not at all. He goes, no, the moon's generating a cold light. I'm going, what are you talking about? And so let me explain really fast. So if it's 90 mm -hmm. degrees in the sun, it's 80 degrees in the shade. We'll just round down, right? So everyone knows it's cooler in the shade than it is in the sunlight. But in the moonlight, it's reversed. Meaning if you are standing in the moonlight, and let's say it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's 60 degrees up to 63 degrees in the moon shade. It's warmer in the moonshade than it is in the moonlight. Now, that, that, doesn't, wait a minute, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense unless the moon is generating a cold light. Because it's, it's, uh, it's a reflection, I mean, well, that, right, that, of that's, sunlight. So it, it should be warm, that, right? You're absolutely right. That's what we're all told. The moon <laughs> is only bright. Well, by the way, it's also too bright. The moon is way too bright considering the Apollo pictures that were taken. If the moon was really that bright when you were on the ground on the moon, it would be glowing but whatever but what i didn't we think figured, about that that's interesting what we figured out <laughs> was is that we we've been able to do this in universities for years now in fact they use in some health beauty products which is you can tune you can change the frequency on a laser and actually make it generate a cold light now we're not talking about mr freeze type stuff but it's you know but you and i it's not like you can use it to chill lettuce or anything like that but it is generating a cold light but the point is at the very least it should not be negative it should be neutral you remember it's bouncing off the sun's radiation right so mm -hmm. you'd think it'd be neutral maybe even a fraction of a degree warmer no it's colder in fact we even took it one step further and i was the first one i will take total credit for this i said i go what happens when you take a magnifying glass to moonlight because remember you take a magnifying glass of sun sunlight oh, you burn you something can, up yeah you yeah. can burn something up right yeah, you take a magnifying sidewalk <laughs> yeah, you can say everybody does that. Uh, the uh, if you take a magnifying glass to moonlight, what happens? Does it does it uh, does it get warmer or does it get colder? It even gets colder. How is really? that possible? Because it's generating a cold laser light, which we can duplicate now. 
what does that say? Does that mean that the earth is flat because the, the, the moon is generating a cold light? And by the way, there's wonderful videos on this. We even had a guy with predator vision go out that didn't believe it and started doing predator vision, you know, thermal stuff with, mm -hmm. with, his, with his camera. And he's like, I'll be damned. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, it's actually true. Um, and, there, and we test it with copper strips and water and all sorts of different crap. And it's absolutely true. I mean, you can do a point and click. I've got a point and click little infrared thermometer you buy for 20 bucks now at the hardware store, usually used on engine blocks and concrete and crap like that. It absolutely yeah. works. Helps if the moon is full in the sky. You know, if it's slow on the horizon, you're probably not going to get much. But does that mean the world's flat? No, it doesn't. But it absolutely destroys the relationships between the sun and the moon. It means the sun is its own independent light. It's a big light bulb. And the moon is just a LED light. It's a night light. That's all it is. The last one, which is um, the, uh, the Van Allen radiation trap question. And I, I treat this, even though I was not a big fan of Karate Kid, it's kind of like the crane kick. Can't be defeated. Here's why. <laughs> so are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly yes or no now, if you don't know what the van allen radiation belts are they were announced by van allen a nasa employee back in the 50s who said oh wow there's all sorts of really thick radiation belts up to like sixty thousand miles thick around the whole world super deadly shouldn't go up there well, that worked for a few years and then candy comes out and we choose to go to the moon this decade oh, it's like oh god and candy was like oh we're gonna go to the moon and, and then they ran back to, to van allen and they said so how are you going to get past these things? He goes, we're going to go real fast. All right. Well, your best speed is 18,000 miles an hour. So 60,000 miles an hour or 60,000 thick. And you're going both ways. And, but here's the big thing. So are they deadly? Yes or no? If you say they're not dead or no, if you say they're deadly, then how the Americans do multiple round trips through these things? Nobody got cancer. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Um, nobody died. There's still, I think, four of these guys limping around today, including Buzz. Wait, is Buzz dead? I don't think he's dead. No, I think he's alive, right? Doesn't matter. I think so. Anyway, so, and, and you're saying, what's the point? My point is, is like, what shielding did they use? There's only three things that stop radiation, right? Lead, obviously. Gold, which is twice as dense as lead. A lot of people know that. And a whole bunch of water, which we use in power plants. Well, all of those three things are terrible ideas for any sort of aeronautics. <laughs> you do not put these right. things on. You don't put anchors on the top of rockets. Mm -hmm. Really, really, really bad idea. It's pretty heavy stuff. <clears throat> so if you're using aluminum and plastic, how the heck are you stopping the radiation? You're not. So then you come back, and I even had, um, uh, oh, who was the big UFO guy that died a few years ago? Um, oh, I can't remember his name, but I'll, I'll figure it out. Anyway, I, I did a debate with him. I'm, I'm embarrassed. I forgot his name. And, um, <clears throat> and I say um, that you say, well, they're not deadly. I go, fine. Then go to the NASA.gov website and look up a little video called Orion trial by fire where the Ryan is our Mars program. And you and they, they made this wonderful video where they said, Oh yeah, by the way, we're not going to be putting men in our, our test capsules anytime soon. Cause we haven't solved the Van Allen radiation problem yet. It's like, what are you, what are you talking about? You, you solved it. You, you solved it perfectly. You solved it back yeah. in the 60s. And you made this video at the end mm -hmm. of 2014. What happened? What, what, what's the deal? So you're, you're stuck either way. They, you either say they're deadly and it's like, well, the Americans went through when they shouldn't have been able to. And you say they're not deadly. It's like, no, NASA says they're very deadly. So you're stuck. The, the flow chart just loops back on itself. Anyway, I threw out those five questions to this guy out of Georgetown and he folded instantly. He was like, and, and, and I don't, but it's not because I'm smarter than him or anything like that. What I did was I took advantage of his tunnel vision, which is most scientists have a very specialized field and scientists are notorious for if, if it's outside of their wheelhouse, they don't like to talk about it because they just don't feel comfortable. I said, oh, I'm not qualified to answer that question. That'd be more for my, my colleague, blah, blah, blah. But there were some of these things he couldn't touch. And so that was it. And the Germans like, oh, we're not going to run the segments. And they went back home and I published the, the initial interview with the Germans, I think, on my channel. But yeah, that usually between those five things, that usually shuts people down. I get very few emails, uh, very few, because I put the challenge out there. I go answer these questions. Anybody answer these so freaking saying, questions. And so you're saying that there hasn't any been any scientists, no NASA scientists or anybody that's that's been able to more or less kind of combat what you're saying you're saying that there's been really nobody that's been able to do that no no and and you wouldn't be able to either i mean the, well one the moon temperature thing's way out of their wheelhouse most people 
scientists have never even heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm. And they really should be doing tests on it. That's just, I mean, I'm sure somebody was just, you know how that goes. Somebody with a <laughs> stupid hardware, it's like, eh, we, we, people do scientific tests, <laughs> uh, amateur scientific tests mm -hmm. all the time. They're usually called rednecks. But in this case, <laughs> you know, but the other things, the eclipse shadow and, and the, the Van Allen belt question, and I, I get it. You know, they, it, they're tough to answer. They really are. Um, Stanton Friedman, that's his name. Stanton Friedman was, um, he, you know, when I told him the, the Van Allen one, <clears throat> he just stopped dead in his tracks. He's like, uh, he's going, why did they make, why did they make that video? You know, the Orion Travel I fired. I go, yeah, I know. Right. They should have never released that. It's almost like we lost something in the generation to where there are kids coming up that they don't know the, the, um, the things you shouldn't put out. And again, NASA's turned into such a sprawling behemoth that you can't control all the aspects simultaneously. Mistakes will be made. Wow. Well, um, I mean, I can't, I can't answer those. I can tell you that um, because I, I don't have the, like, I'll, I'll well, use that. I will, I will send them to you. I will email them to you and uh, feel free. If you, if you have any suggestions after the fact, by all means, let me know. Well, fascinating. I mean, um, gosh, uh, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you find that a lot of people just, um, it's a hard thing to get your arm around, arms around, man, because, it, you know, again, um, it's not even something most people probably even think about or even ponder, but you throw those things out there and it's like, those are interesting points. Um, yeah. And I, I can't answer any of them. I have no idea. Right. I'd, I've never, I've never been off the earth. <laughs> so, and, 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 you know. and by the way, that's to, to your point, nobody owns a spaceship. You, when, when yep. space was militarized back in the day, and that's really all they did back in the 1950s was, um, was militarized space. They, um, they made it to where the general public, didn't have access to that to that sort of stuff and because of that no one can prove it for themselves they can't and so they just rely on the people in the lab coats this is why i made a video called some years ago called the code of credibility which is if you are wearing a lab coat you are instantly more credible because people immediately defer it's like wow well, he's wearing a lab coat and a bow tie you know he's obviously more intelligent than me which is why and let me i, I don't want to drag this on too much but i got to mention bill nye because i got to take a shot at somebody okay. which is Bill Nye, the science guy, who has a bachelor's degree in mechanical, immediately abandoned it to become an actor. I know this because he worked for an, uh, an amateur comedy studio up in Seattle called Almost Live. And I was up here. I was living in Seattle at the time. I watched him on the weekends. And when I would talk to producers, when I started doing this stuff, I ended up talking to a lot of field producers. And I said, why do you keep putting Bill on TV? He's not even a real, you know, he doesn't even have a master's degree in anything. And it's like, yeah, but he looks the part. And what had happened was they, they, they realized that through conditioning, because he did this, this little skit up here called Bill Nye the Science Guy, which Disney then bought and said, hey, do this Bill Nye the Science Guy because it's squeaky clean. You know, it's perfect for our channel. Ran for five years and then was syndicated forever, right? Because it's, it's timeless. It's not Sesame Street or anything, but it's, you know, a lot of people grew up with that. And then you had producers that were like, yeah, let's just get Bill on. Let's have them start, start talking about stuff. Bill, what's your opinion on climate change? What's your opinion on the Mars rover? What's your opinion on quantum mechanics and string theory? He has no idea. But if he just reads a couple of the, you know, the cliff notes on it, people will like watching it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Bill knows. He's the guy. Yeah. Well, if, if, if what you're saying is, is, is real and, and true, I, I mean, why aren't are there scientists that are looking into this type of thing? I guess why aren't there? Why aren't, People Ew. blowing the whistle on it. Well, no, no, no. You can't. Who, who are you gonna do? The, what I have learned from the academic friends that I have I have talked to over the years, which is when you reach, especially when you get past your master's and you're getting to your PhD, mm -hmm. is that the only thing they care about, the only thing they care about when they reach that level, sorry, is peer groups and being published. That's it. The scariest word in the academic world is ostracized. Which means if you oh, are the person, and, and because it's tough, you don't want to be, I've talked to some of these guys, if it's not that, not forget about whistleblowing, they don't want to even be caught in the same room as a flat earther. Because if you are going to debate a flat earther, treat it like a boxing match. Hmm. You are the heavy favorite if you're the scientist, right? But if that flat oh, yeah. earther doesn't go down in the first round, the eyes aren't on the flat earther anymore. They're on you. And they're saying, 
hey, why haven't you knocked out that flat earth guy yet? Why is he on the get? Why is he still standing? And the longer he, the flat earth keeps up, you know, goes toe to toe, the worse you look to where at the end, if flat earth, even if, if flat earth doesn't win, right? Even mm -hmm. if, if they just, as long as they're still standing, all of a sudden now that the, the match is over and that boxer leaves, the, his entire community just descends upon him. It's like, what the hell were you thinking? You know, you were... Yeah. <clears throat> And then they then they say, yeah, you can't hang out with us anymore, and that's it. You're you're done. I mean, has, has anybody debate? Has any scientists and people that are astronomers debated like people very on this? Very very few. And how do those debates go? They go very very well because of the points I I, I bring up. He's like, look, we so they don't have answers for your stuff. No, I they don't. You. They don't. I mean, they've got <clears> answers for some <throat> things, but again, when you reach a certain level of, of academia, you can only talk about those topics. But if I go off on a side road or whoever it is goes off on a side road, how are you going to, you can't address it. You're, you're in no man's land. You can't regurgitate textbook material. Your textbook material doesn't apply to that. Not really. So you try to make it fit. Maybe if you're, if you're quick on your feet, but most of the time you can't. So you're, you're stuck, which is why most of them like Neil deGrasse Tyson is never going to touch us. Brian Cox, never going to touch us. Michio Kaku, nope, nope, nope. Um, Bill Nye, no, no. I mean, we put the invitations out there to everybody for oh, years. Oh, gotcha. Um, it is very, very tough to do. I think we've done, I probably count on How, how do they react? I mean, do they just, do they just discard it, uh, you know, or do oh, they yeah. tell yeah, you why like, they don't want to debate you? Well, there's, that's just it. Publicly, they'll just say, well, yeah, that's beneath me. It's like, it's obvious. That's been settled for thousands of years. But, but privately, What's happening is they they can't debate because you don't again you don't want to be that guy. No right. one wants to be that guy. Neil deGrasse Tyson, no, he doesn't do debates anyway. He's a stage performer. I get it. He's got his niche, but you he's don't not. You're saying he's not a scientist. He's not a um... no 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 no. He not. He's a scientist in name only. And I drive. Oh, okay. I have talked to enough grad students. Some some. I get to talk to some some fresh physicists. You know the ones that are just out of school. And, or, or they're usually young and I bring up Neil deGrasse and boy, they get so infuriated. I go, yeah, he's your high priest. And they're like, no, he's not. He's not. He doesn't <laughs> represent us. I go, oh yeah, he does. He, I go, he's the one on TV. He's your guy. But, he, but in look in, in Neil's defense, he is a hell of a stage performer. He could have done his stage presence is so good that he could have been, he could have done anything. He could have done self help videos. He could have done a version of Tony Robbins. He could have done any of that stuff. He just chose astrophysics and it worked out really well for him <laughs> because he goes on stage and he does his, I'm not being racist when I say this, but he's a cross between, his performance is a cross between uh, Bill Cosby and Sinbad. That's his, his thing. I mean, I can see it when I'm watching up there. I've watched a lot of comedians over the years. He's got good comedic timing, but that's his wheelhouse. <laughs> like to go he does his song and dance boop, 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 boop. science is great science is amazing and then he goes off stage and that's it um he doesn't like doing debates because then it gets it, that's not a that's not usually a happy tone funny type of thing it's a serious debate he doesn't want to do it he's never done it he's already said he, he goes he's never ever going to do it well i actually saw him one time on a video mm -hmm. and it was very surprising they were asking him, you know, about how far away the sun is and the shadow, sh angles of the shadows and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, well, the math adds up this way. That's why it's provable. And someone yeah. asked him, well, does the math also make sense if you make it the flat earth model? And he goes, mm -hmm. yeah. Really? <laughs> he, he said that? He said, yeah. So the math is the same if the, because, if the um, scales mm. were different. So I yeah, 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 yeah. Because Which that was one of my questions. Yeah. Like, I thought, you know, mathematically can't, you know, that, came, that started with Copernicus, right? The mathematics well, of... It's, a, it's an honest... Well, even be, it started even before Copernicus. Coperni the Copernican solar system model, that's one thing. But the argument that's even older than that is the sticks and shadows argument which goes back all the Middle East. And most of the time I don't bring it up in interviews because, well, most people don't get it. But what? But to your point, Mike, uh, Bill Nye has helped us more than he's hurt us in that he, he understands because he's absolutely right. Yes, if the sun is 400,000 miles wide and 93 million miles away, it will cast a shadow that looks like this. But if the sun is less than 100 miles wide and it's like 3,000 miles away, it will also cast a shadow like right. that. And, and people, and, and it's like, yeah, but we know it's 93 million miles away. It's like, really? How do you know? Exactly. And because you, the, these assumptions have to be made. He did this wonderful speech on stage. Cause again, he does these great performances for, for someone. And he was making fun of the Red Bull jump. Oh, I loved it when he did that, where he said, 
um, that it was scientifically dishonest because he was seeing all the pictures that were being taken of the Red Bull jump, you know, the, the, where they went up 130,000 feet, they had him jump out of a balloon. And the, the fisheye lens that they were using showed, it made him look like he was at least 400 miles up, at least, right? And the curvature was just exaggerated to where it's like, whoa, so the whole world is New Mexico? That's, that's, that's <laughs> what you're saying here? That's how big the world is? And he, and he knew this and he, so he called him out on it and he said, he goes, no, he goes, you can't see the curve from, from 130,000 feet. He goes, he goes, he goes, it's flat. Now that was very interesting because I threw that back at a lot of people. Cause I've had thousands of people email me and say, I've seen the curvature from an airplane. And I go, really have you? Cause Neil deGrasse Tyson, the world's most famous scientist said that no civilian will ever see the curvature of the earth. And here's, what? here's him. Why would it be flat if there's, um, you know, so why, why would, would he be say flat at 130,000 right, feet? Right. Because is he saying he's, it's just so big? He's saying that the curvature wouldn't even be visible until much, much higher. Because it's such so, a large, because it's, it's such so a large, large mass. I got you. Okay. Wouldn't be able to see it. I get you. But, okay. But that gets thrown in the face of all these people that I've talked to over the years that have said that, uh, that, that they've seen it from mountaintops. And I mean, I still have had people say, I can see it from the beach. It's like, no, you can't. I mean, it's not, not the forward and backwards, side to side that they say it's from the beach. I'm going, no. And then I throw him the Neil deGrasse Tyson video. I go, so is Neil wrong? And <laughs> they just, they just, and, and I've had some, you know, some physicist people say, oh, yeah, he's wrong. He doesn't represent us. And I go, well, there you go again, because he does. I go, if you think he's wrong, by all means, challenge him, see if you can get it on television. You're not, it's not going to happen. In fact, if he ever dies, I all hope he doesn't die because. There's no one that could fill his shoes right now. He's the only, he's one of the few guys that's actually keeping flat earth at bay because people <laughs> like, well, if Neil's, if Neil's, you know, against it, that's good enough for me. <laughs> I was like, all right, I guess. Anyway, well, heck, well, heck I'm, I'm, I, I, I feel like I should go watch the movie, the Truman show. It's a good movie. I like the, the Truman movie. show. It's a great I, movie. I, I've always been kind of a, 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 I'm a Jim Carrey fan. So it's, you know, I think I need to go watch that one. <laughs> I, 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 the Truman show really resonated with me. Um, they used it multiple times in the documentary, um, huh. but it shows people how easy it, well, let me two quick things. And then unfortunately I got to wrap this up pretty quick, which is um, the Truman show. It took a 20 mile wide structure that cost billions of dollars to fool him. Mm -hmm. But there was another movie that I mentioned in the clues called The Village from M. Night Shyamalan, which showed you yeah, also yeah. dude on the, on the cheap, which was there wasn't even a dome structure. You just take some people, you raise kids from infants in a wildlife preserve, and you can, you know, in a wooden log cabin town, and you can make up any story you want. Because kids believe anything that adults tell them. And then you say, oh, yeah, by the way, there's monsters in the woods. Don't go there, which might as well be Antarctica. And that's it. And here's where it gets interesting. As soon as those parents pass away from natural causes, no one's lying anymore. Everybody there could pass a lie detector. Test. It's like, yeah, by the way, we're living in the 1800s. Don't know where we are. Here's the map of our town. Uh, we farm this and this is our lives. And that shows you how easy it is to, you know, to get people to, we, the line in the Truman show, circle back which uh, was said by Ed Harris, you know, the, the, the creator, yeah. which was, we believe the reality that is presented to us. We want to believe things. We, we don't immediately, we're not instantly suspicious, not when we're growing up. Kids don't believe, you know, kids will believe anything the adults tell them. Uh, it's, the, it's why suspension of disbelief is a term. When you go into the movies, just use the movie reference. Mm -hmm. Why do you get emotional watching a movie on a screen? You're sitting next to other people. You know it's a movie. You know it was made last year. You know the actors. You know what other movies they were being in. So why are you getting emotional? Suspension of belief. You want to believe it. Which is why <laughs> bad movies fall apart. And people are like, ah, turn it. You all say the same thing. I'm not buying it. Click. So there you go. Well, I know, I know we're up against it. And I know you got to run. But hey, this hey, fascinating conversation and a lot of fun. And um, yeah, definitely, um, gosh, uh, don't. I, I, I'm very interested to have you send me the stuff you're talking about. It'd be kind of interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. to take a look at it. And I, what's I, the name of the, uh, the, the documentary? If you wouldn't mind, just send me oh, that yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Never, Hang on. I will it'd be kind of fun to watch. Hang on one second. I will send you the, in fact, I'll send you all the links right now. So yeah, thanks. there's, I'll send you the books and the links. And here, we'll just do this. Let's delete all this. One second. Kill all that. 
and paste that in and hopefully get all these links. So what I sent you was uh, the, uh, the Flat Earth app, which we created, wonderful stuff. Testingtheglobe.com, which is the religious angles, if anyone's into the religious side of the thing, Flat Earth. Um, uh, Stephen Carpenter, the Deftones. Models, if you want physical models, there's people that make models. Uh, BehindTheCurveFilm.com. You'll see that on the way okay. down there. Uh, Behind the Curve is the name of the film. Uh, I enjoyed making it. They hated us. Uh, it is not <laughs> exactly pro Flat Earth. It is back and forth. I mean, any movie with Scott Kelly being interviewed against Flat Earth, that's never going to go well. Uh, and then uh, some of the books and the other stuff. So, all right. Well, cool. Uh, well, well, thanks for coming on and sharing your perspective. And thanks yeah. for coming on Liberty Monks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thank you for, for not just attacking me in front of your audience. I know some of your audience members are probably saying, oh my God, this guy's <laughs> nuts. Let me end with this. It's like, look, I'm not here to convince you. I'm not here to persuade you. Take everything I say with a grain of salt, but most of all, do your own research and ask questions. All right. Well, uh, with that said, um, hey, God bless you, sir. God bless you. And God bless everyone out there listening tonight. Um, and as always, God bless America. Until next time, be safe and well. Thank you.